Would y'all stand with me? I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing, but Good. 
very much. I want to read to you this morning from the book of Psalm chapter 8. It says, when I consider your, I thought of this uh, verse, I thought of the scripture when, during that last psalm. It says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You've made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and all that swim in the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we do thank you for a, a great morning to be in your house. The beauty that we see all around us, we know you made it all. And we know that you left us to take care of it. I pray we'll do just that. God, we come this morning with a heart full of worship and, uh, and ask you, God, to, um, to just uh, uh, open our hearts, pierce our hearts, and let us leave here this morning in a better place than when we came. We love you, God. We, we lift up these things in the name of your Savior. And in your son, our Savior, in your son. Amen. <laughs> This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, excited about our Wednesday nights starting up this week. If, so if you're a youth and you're here and you haven't got a t-shirt yet, we'd love to get you a t-shirt. So come find me after service. But for communion this morning, um, I'm, for some reason I was thinking about a time back when I moved to Valley View and I started playing football. Now I went to Brooklyn 
But my dad was so, he was just focused on me playing football for some reason. He played football growing up, so he wanted me to. So I moved to, to Valley View, and I don't know anything about football. And, you know, I show up on the first day, and my hip pads are upside down. My, my helmet didn't fit right, and I, I just, it didn't, didn't fit in. Chris is, is laughing over here at me. I played football with him. Um, so I show up to football, and my dad keeps asking me every day after practice, are you getting to play much? I'm telling him, you know, yeah, I'm getting to play, and so on and so forth. He keeps asking me. So what I would do after practice would be over, I would go get some grass out of the ground, and I'd, I'd rip it out of the ground, and I'd take it, and I'd rub it on my pants, so that when my dad picked me up, it looked as if I got to play a whole lot. Because I didn't want to let him down. I wanted to make him proud of me. And telling that story, it reminds me of me wanting to make my father proud and wanting to be close to my father, right? It, it takes me back to a place where that's, I just wanted him to be, be proud of me. And, and I have a question this morning. Is, is who, were, who are we trying to make proud this morning, this week, this, this summer, this year? Who are we trying to please? Um, I've, always, I've always been a believer, and I'd like to read a verse for you. It is Psalm 145, 18 through 20. It says, The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear Him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love Him. And as I tell that story, you know, I'm, I'm always concerned with, am I, am I making my father proud? Not my, my earthly father, but my heavenly father. As if my actions day to day, did those line up with what would make him proud and not who would make my earthly father proud? Hopefully they're both proud. But my heavenly father is who I'm trying to make proud on a daily basis. So as we go to communion, let's think about who are we trying to please? Who do we want to be close to? Who do we want to make proud? And um, amen. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're here with you this morning, God. Just, just speak to us, God. Um, let, let Mitch's words be your words. Let a heart be pierced. Let ears be open. And let us all go closer to you as a church and, and, and individu individually, God. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
guys. Um, you know, here uh, for the past several weeks, um, uh, I've, I've really bragged on our, our music team and and um, and asked you to uh, show them how much you appreciate them. Dad didn't even have to. You clapped before I even asked. So uh, that's awesome. Um, we're changing the culture a little bit, right? I'm going to sit down just a few minutes. Got a lot uh, catching up I want to do. First of all, again, it's great to see you. Uh, we're glad you're here with us, and um, and it's just fun to be back. Um, we got a lot going on, a couple of meetings next week. A lot of this is in your bulletin, and you can keep up with what's going on there. But um, like I said earlier, we haven't done a lot since March, okay? And, and we're starting to pick back up some of our programs. And so uh, a couple of meetings next week are Wednesday nights. We'll be back in person this week. But I tell you what, um, I know that uh, there are still a lot of folks that enjoy our Wednesday nights. And it's kind of been a, a, a fun summer with, with uh, my wife and I uh, doing that. Um, and, and so we're, we're gonna, um, I'm going to continue to do our Facebook Live for a little bit on our Wednesday nights and kind of see how that goes even with people in, and, um, and that'll be at 6.30 on Wednesday. Uh, we, uh, uh, the CWF has, has got a basket out there for Brody and Hayden Simak. Starting next week, they're going to have another one out there for John, and, uh, John Gay and Sarah Renfro. They're going to be getting married um, on the 12th. Uh, that's this coming weekend. CWF meetings, this is not in your bulletin, CWF meetings are going to start back in October, and so uh, stay tuned for that, we'll have all the, the um, details there. One last thing that's not in your bulletin, um, I'm going to be part, part of a service on Friday, September 11th, uh, it's called Patriots Day, it's out at the VFW Post here in Jonesboro on Airport Road at noon, um, it's um, uh, a lot of different people, police, fire, um, military, it's um, to honor our heroes on September 11th, 9-11, and um, be part of that, representing the, the fire department as a chaplain. I'm excited about that, and uh, so if you want to, um, I think that's going to be streamed live on the, the Facebook VFW uh, or else, I don't remember, but somebody's got that on. I'll try to find out, and I'll post a link on there. Uh, that's going to be uh, Facebook Live as, as well as open to anybody that wants to come, so come out there you want to be a, a, a present for that I've, I've, um, I've talked a little bit each uh, week about uh, praying for our schools and, um, and and posting that on our church Facebook as well continue to, to lift up our schools they, things are going okay so far and I've been visiting with some teachers in here this morning we're so proud that we're represented in our public schools with uh, good Christian teachers and leaders there and uh, I think that's very important for us not to just uh, to try to shelter ourselves away from, from public schools, but to make a difference wherever we are. And uh, we're going to talk today about being salt and light. And we can do that anywhere. So continue to pray for our schools, that, uh, that uh, our, our, our administrators, our teachers, our students, and all those who work there, that everybody will be safe and uh, have a good school year. Uh, last thing, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was honest with you guys and told you that uh, things had run aground just a little bit with me, and I was at a dry place, but, um, but boy, I'll tell you, we got away last weekend, and, um, and, and I want to say uh, thanks to Calvin and Helen Henderson. They took us uh, fishing up on the White River. We caught a lot of trout. We were, it was fun, but my first time trout, I was born and raised in Arkansas, and, uh, and I hunted and fished my whole life, but never been trout fishing. And it was so much fun. It was relaxing. It's just what I needed this, this week to celebrate my wife's birthday and our anniversary, which was the same day. We went up in, uh, in the hills and, and just got away a little bit, kind of off the grid. And, uh, man, I'm telling you, I feel great. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to see you guys. And I appreciate every text message, every phone call, and, and uh, every card I've received. And uh, you don't know how much it means to me that you guys uh, care about us. We celebrated our, I celebrated our uh, uh, 13th anniversary here at Christian Valley. It's been here 13 years. And uh, the church gave us a little bit of a gift, which was not little, it was a good gift. And, um, and, and that helped us with our vacation just to, uh, to have fun. And that's what we needed and sometimes you need rest, and, and I forget that as much as I preach it, but I forget it sometimes, and so uh, be sure and, um, and rest yourself physically, spiritually, and mentally to uh, stay in tune in your walk with Jesus. 
Hey kids, why don't y'all head on back to the treehouse this morning? And we're going to get cranked up here with a brand new sermon series this morning. Oh, one more thing I, I meant to say. I had a, a young lady who said she left a Valley View mask here at church with a lanyard on it. If you see one, I've looked and I can't find it, but if you see a mask that looks like it would fit a child that says Valley View on it, um, just, just give it to me and we'll make it sure it gets to the rightful owner. Great to see our kids heading back this morning. We, um, we are excited that uh, we've got that part of our uh, worship service back in tune, and, um, and it's good to, to have all of our kids here uh, with us for sure today. Um, we are going to open up a new series. It's called Jesus Unfiltered, and, um, and, and that's kind of a term uh, that you might hear some now. People say, well, a person lost their filter, right? Well, what's that mean? It just means they say whatever they're thinking. And, and I'm going to tell you, uh, we celebrated my wife's birthday this, this week, and I told her she's now older than me because my birthday was in March, and there were no birthdays in March, right? Am I the only one here that had a, a March or April birthday? And you just got totally skipped over, right? So I didn't have a birthday. She's older than I am now. And, uh, and, and but... And, but, you know, when you get to a certain age, you don't want birthdays anymore. It just kind of reminds you you're getting older. And, and I'm just telling you, there's not a lot I'm looking forward to when I get older, except for one thing. You see, when folks get older, they don't have a filter, right? And they get by with it. If you go out and say the kind of things that my grandpa said to people when he was, was an older man, well, somebody might punch you. Right? But when somebody older does that, it's funny. And everybody says, oh, they just lost their filter. I've got to looking forward to the days when I can say what I'm thinking and, and nobody gets offended, all right? Uh, Jesus didn't have a problem saying what he was thinking. All right? He knew the scripture. He, said, he preached the scripture and he told it like it was. We're going to look the next few weeks at the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew uh, chapter 5. 6 and 7, and I'm going to tell you, Jesus is going to step on your toes here a little bit. He's going to say something in this, in this sermon over the next few weeks. We're not going to cover every verse of it. We're just going to hit the high spots, but over the next few weeks, we're going to hit some spots here that are um, uh, pretty controversial in our world today. You see, uh, uh, some, somehow we've changed the rules. We, we think, well, the Bible's pretty good I guess the Bible the Bible's okay, except for there are parts of it that aren't relevant anymore. That's wrong, okay? Sermon on the Mount's a little over 100 verses. It's a little short of uh, 2,500 words, and it hits pretty hard. And so if you think that it's okay to, um, to read the Bible and then say, oh, well, hold it just a second, that's not relevant anymore today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that part of the Bible, and I'm just going to, I'm going to get rid of it, right? Because I, I like it better. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't fit me anymore. Then you don't want to read what we're going we're gonna to read the next few weeks. All right? If, if you think you can take a page out every now and then just because it doesn't fit our lifestyles anymore, Jesus is going to, his unfiltered here is going to rub you wrong. I challenge you to stick with us. Okay? And today may be not so bad. You look at this first part of the sermon, you say, well, he, you know, he's just kind of easing in. He didn't want to jump into the deep end too soon. There's some real challenges here. He starts off with uh, what's called the Beatitudes. We're not going to look at the Beatitudes. He starts off and, and he says, blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are those. And it's kind of upside down from what our world thinks is good. And the word blessed there just basically means happy. You're happy if you're poor in spirit. You're happy if you're meek. You know, and you're happy if you're hungry for righteousness. Basically, to wrap that up, Jesus says, blessed are those who are at the end of the rope. Okay? They need to hear a good sermon. And that's what he's going to tell them here. And so he opens this sermon talking about some things that are just very, very real to the people who would have heard it in the first century. So... What's our one thing today? What, what's the thing that we want you to take today and, and go out in the world and, and just really remember and put in your heart? Our one thing today is this. When the Bible gives us difficult words to follow, 
We need to embrace them, not erase them. All right? You can't rip, don't rip the pages out of your Bible. And, and you know, I, I told Brandon this morning, um, I saw that, I saw uh, Bill Griffin, who was one of my one of my mentors early on in ministry, I saw him one day uh, throw some pages out of his Bible as part of a sermon. And I always thought, if I have a, I mean, I, I hope y'all know I didn't rip those pages out, but I always thought, if, when I have a Bible that tears up and the binding comes loose, I'm not putting in the trash, I'm going to keep it so I can show you what it's like to throw words out of the Bible. It doesn't work for us. It's not going to work for us, and that's not what Jesus wants us to do. By the way, I, I mentioned talking to Brandon this morning. I want y'all to know, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, um, I, I was very rested last week being away. It's so good to know that, um, that Brandon was going to be up here doing a good job last week, and he did. I watched it online okay i couldn't watch it live we were kind of in the middle of nowhere last sunday morning but i watched it when i got home great sermon i appreciate it a lot and i'm humbled because there were more people here last week than there are today all right i know it's a holiday weekend but i was gone and and you don't know how good that makes me feel not to have to hide the fact i'm going to be gone i can just say hey brandon's going to be here and you guys come out now if I ever show up for work and he's got grass stains on his pants, I'm going to know that he's not been working that hard, all right? He's, <laughs> he's wanting me to think he is, but that's okay. But I appreciate his word last week for sure. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. That's pretty plain. You're the, you are the salt of the earth. And I'm going to tell you, I like salt. I have all salt. I, I love salt and... and um, and, and, and so he says, you're the salt of the earth. I say, well, that's a good thing. He doesn't say you ought to be salt of the earth. All right? And so even though this isn't as tough as what Jesus is going to get into in the next few weeks, he doesn't let us have any wiggle room here. He says, you are the salt of the earth. That's pretty plain. These are your marching orders. And I'm just going to tell you, in one of my classes back when I was in, in Bible college, we had to memorize the Sermon on the Mount. Now, it was in a, a New International Version that was a little older, and so it's not quite the what, the, the what I'm going to read today. But I just want you to know, if you hide the Word of God in your heart, you don't forget it. And even though that was a long, long time ago, that's, these words just still, they just kind of pop up. So today, um, if I don't match up with what you're seeing on your screen, it's because I'm saying this out of memory. He says, you are the salt of the earth. It's Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. But if a salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. He said, and so here we are. He says, you're, you're salt. And I look at that as good because I love salt. I have always been a salter up until last October. I went to the doctor, and the doctor says, hey, your blood pressure's not too bad here. You're, you're really in a good range for somebody your age supposed to be a compliment but he said it's a little higher than it was last year he said you might want to cut back on and he, he gave me a list and one of them was salt he said you might want to cut back what well, uh, okay I'm a salter I, yeah, I understand what you're talking about so I just quit I know there's salt in all the foods I eat but I don't put salt on my food anymore and that's odd for me because I used to be the guy that would salt my food and taste it to see if it needed to be salted right and I would cut a slice of brand, I mean, a, a really nice looking homegrown tomato, and I would slice it, and then I'd put salt on it, okay? And I just want to ask you a question here. When you cut open a watermelon and get you some in your bowl, do you put salt on your watermelon? Okay, good. How many does not would say no, no way, salt on a watermelon? All right, and the rest of y'all, I guess, just don't eat watermelon. All right, but the uh, but, but majority here ruled, and we said salt is good on watermelon. I, I, amen, brother. Um, salt's good. I love it. So Jesus says you're salt to the earth. I take that as a compliment. Salt does a lot of things. Salt did, did a lot in the uh, first century. Salt was very valuable. In fact, the word salary, our word salary comes from the word salt. Uh, it was a commodity. Salt was a commodity. You might go do a, 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 some work for somebody, and instead of taking a coin for the work you did, they might give you a, a 
a bag of salt, okay? And because salt was so good. Salt, and, and, we're, and, and since uh, um, we're salt, then we're supposed to make our world a better place, right? We're supposed to make our home a better place. We're supposed to make our work a better place. We're supposed to make our uh, city halls a better place. We're supposed to make our schools a better place. We're supposed to make our hospitals a better place. Wherever you are, you are supposed to be salt. So what's salt do? Well, salt seasons. We've been talking about that. Salt. I put salt on my food because it, uh, to me, it, it enhances the flavor. And I've got used to not having salt on my food. I'm just going to tell you it's a little bit bland. And some of it, I think, man, I wish I could put some salt on there, but if I ever do this, I'm going to be hung, and, I, and I'm going to fall off the wagon here, and I'm going to be like going and buying salt at Sam's, you know, where you have like a pallet of salt, and, uh, and, and I can't do that. I mean, it's going to kill me. The salt seasons. And in the same way that, that salt seasons our food and it gives it flavor, we are the one that's going out here in the world to make Christ attractive, okay? We are the one that, that seasons God's word to where everybody hears it and says, hold it just a second. I want to be a part of what you're doing here. This looks good. I like what you're doing. I want to, I want to be a part of it, okay? We're, you are salt of the earth. You, you season everything around you. You make it better. Salt also preserves. This was probably the, the reason people wanted so much salt in the first century. They didn't have um, uh, uh, freezers. Right, they maybe had a hole in the ground that they would uh, put something down in, maybe some hang some meat down in there. It kept it a little cooler. But the way they preserved that so it didn't go bad is they would just coat it with salt, okay? And they put all this salt around it, and and and, uh, and then they would it would help preserve the meat. Not as long as a freezer, okay? But it was very very valuable in the first century to have salt to preserve what was. Uh, what was highly valuable. And in the same way, um, we have got to be the one that preserves what is good and right, okay? We have got to prevent corruption. We've got to prevent our society from sinking to a spot where it can never get back to where God wants it. We are the one that preserves what is good and right because we are the salt of the earth. Salt cleanses. You heard uh, about putting salt in a wound. Well, there was a time when... Uh, uh, modern medicine didn't exist, and salt was actually used to, to clean wounds. That, that probably didn't feel too good. It probably felt just about as bad as that orange stuff my mom used to put on me when I would scrape my knees on my bicycle, right? And I don't know what that stuff was. It came in a glass bottle, and she'd say, hold still. Anytime they tell you hold still, that means it's going to hurt. It's going to burn, right? And, and so salt was used to cleanse wounds with. I don't know if that worked or not. I'm not going to try it. It, clean, it cleans a lot. Of, you might put uh, salt in your pool. Salt will clean your pool. Salt will clean our roads or our sidewalks when, uh, in the wintertime. Huh? Salt is a cleanser. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, we meet a lot of people who need help with, with cleansing their soul. And, and you and I can't do that, but we can lead them to the one who can. All right? And so we are salt to the earth. You know something I think that salt does? It, it creates thirst. So I, I really, uh, you don't really ever see this when it talks about salt, but, you know, the other night we ate, uh, it doesn't matter, if it, two, two things, Mexican food and fish. If we eat Mexican food or fish, I usually wake up in the middle of the night really thirsty. You ever do that, or is it just me? Probably because I eat too much, okay? But, but we do. We go out the other night, we ate some fish, and I woke up, sure enough, I woke up in the middle of the night, I was so thirsty because that fish was really salty. It was good. I liked it. But it created this thirst. And so if we are salt of the earth, what are we supposed to be creating thirst for? Well, the Bible tells us we need to thirst for hunger and righteousness. And there's a world of people out here who are looking for, for, for uh, um, righteousness. They're hungry. They're, they're thirsting for righteousness. And, and the only way they're going to find it sometimes is, is you because you are the salt of the earth. We... Um, you know, uh, Jesus calls himself living water. And, and if, if somebody is thirsty, what do they need? They need water. And, and he is the water they need. Now, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but, uh, but it doesn't take much salt 
to make a difference. If you've oversalted something and if you were cooking and everybody, they, they, they really dig in and, man, they can't wait. And then if you start seeing those looks like, hmm, not sure about that, right? That's because you oversalted something. And so it doesn't take a lot of salt to, to make a big difference. And, you know, the, the crazy thing about salt is it doesn't really get any credit. And so if we're out here, if we're the salt of the earth, we don't have to worry about getting credit because nobody's ever really uh, dug into a big, nice, juicy piece of watermelon and said, man, that watermelon really enhances the flavor of that salt, right? That salt is great, and I like it even better with watermelon on it. Nobody says that. And so we have to humble ourselves to realize that we are the salt of the earth, but we're not the one that people are seeking. Our, our salt is on obviously a, a chemical, it's sodium chloride. The salt in the first century came from the Dead Sea. It, they, they collected it along the shoreline of the, of the Dead Sea, which was a salty body of water. It was kind of a dead body of water that didn't have fresh water flowing in or out. And so uh, they would collect this salt from the, the shoreline there. They would sift this salt out of the water. And, and, and it was very valuable, but one of the things that you have to know about first century salt was that they reused it. Can you imagine that, going around uh, along after uh, dinner time, saying, okay, let's rake the salt off the edge of your plate and off the table where you, you, you didn't use it, right? They, they reused their salt, and so they would filter this salt back through again and again after they would use it to preserve meat maybe they would take they would rake the salt off and then they would filter it back through and what he's talking about here when he says when salt loses its saltiness is, is that it would it could be used a few times and then it was no good anymore it lost its flavor it lost the ability to preserve and so he says it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and used as a sidewalk you just walk on it after that okay and so, um, and, and so he, that's, our, um, that, that's our challenge. First challenge, you're the salt of the earth. And, and I told you that this one seems a little easier than the rest of the, the, the messages in this series. But if he says you are the salt of the earth, here's your challenge. Don't get caught up in the world, okay? Don't lose your saltiness. Don't get contaminated. You see, what happens there is, is when you lose your saltiness, the Bible calls that foolish. He says you are a, only a fool uh, goes along with the ways of the world. And so your challenge here is to be salty, to season, to preserve, to cleanse, to create thirst in everybody that, that comes into contact with you. He also says you are the light of the world, okay? And... Um, uh, if you move along to, to verse uh, 14, uh, it says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither does a, a, a man light a, a, a lamp and, and put it under a bowl. No, he puts it on a stand so that it gives light to everyone in the room. In the same way, let your good deeds shine among men so that uh, people will see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Okay, it says you're the light of the world. And in the same way I read that one that says you're salt, and I think, oh, that's a good thing. I read the one that says you're the light of the world, and I think that's good too because I don't like the dark. I've told you that before. I'm honest about this. Dark's not my favorite. If I have to pick light and dark, I'm going to pick light every time. My wife and I were in uh, Mountain View this week, and we went down to Blanchard Springs and looked around. We actually saw the actual spring. I guess I'm, I'm uh, at this point funny age where um, I realized if it's called Blanchard Springs, there has to be a spring, right? And there was a lot of water coming out of the ground, but, um, but, but usually when we go there, I don't like Blanchard Springs because it's a big hole in the ground, right? It's a cavern. And, and I'm not a fan of caverns. And, and I'm going to just tell you why. Last year, in fact, last year, for the first time in a long time, we went back up to Blanchard Springs. We went to something called Caroling in the Cavern. It's pretty cool. Uh, old, uh, like folk music, uh, bluegrass type uh, Christmas music in the cavern. You know the only thing wrong with it? It was in the cavern. Yeah, I didn't like that at all. We went down in there, and, and there weren't very many lights on. There weren't that many of us. We're sitting in there, and they're playing music. And the whole time, all I could think of was, we are a long way under the ground right here, okay? Huh? 
and, and, and I don't know what's going on up above us. I wasn't worried about the, like the roof caving in and burying us alive or anything like that. What I was worried about, lights going out. Can you imagine how dark that place? It's a hole in the ground, okay? We took an elevator to get down to it. I don't know how deep we were under the ground. All I know is if the lights go out, Mitch is getting out of here. Huh? I don't know where. That there's going to be an exit somewhere. I'm not a fan of the dark. I don't, I don't, I, I've never really found what, what is better in the dark. And I'm just going to tell you, we live in a dark world. Huh? There's abuse all around us. There's addiction all around us. Money is dark. Uh, divorce is dark. Racial is... Uh, uh, okay, 2020 is trying to set the bar on dark. Is it not? Huh? Because I've, I've been counting up. I, I'm just starting to think maybe God's given us ten plagues here. Virus, right? Racial issues. Tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. We had an earthquake here. We were actually up in uh, up on the White River and didn't feel the nurse earthquake. I'm okay with that, right? Floods. What else? I, I'm murder hornets. I, I they, you know I don't know. We're up to about seven or eight plagues for this year. 2020 is darker than I can ever remember. So what do we need? We need light. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I'm going to tell you what, Jesus, that's what I want. I want a light I can carry with me. Because the world is dark and I need some light. Jesus says, I am the light. He said, I am a lot of things. Seven I am that Jesus said. And one of them, he said, I am the the light, man, that makes me feel good. Uh, um, but, but let me ask you this. When he, says, uh, when he says to us, you are the light of the world, what, what's that mean? Well, it means that we are the one who eliminates Jesus to the people around us, okay? They may not know Jesus. They may not know where the source of the light is. But what they do know is, is they may look at you and be a little envious because your world seems a little better than the, the world they live in. And they might even uh, want to have the nerve to ask you, Jesus, uh, excuse me, where, where are you uh, finding this source of your light? And all you have to do is say, Jesus is my light. Jesus is the light of the world. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2, 9. But, uh, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession... Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness, what? Into the wonderful light. Now we get used to the dark. We do. We become accustomed to dark. And, and I, you know, uh, we were talking the other day. I, I've kind of prided myself over the years. I've worked, I've had times when I worked late and had times where I worked in the middle, of, came in in the middle of the night from work or I got up really, really early and uh, left for work. And over the years, I've really prided myself in being able to come in and, um, and, and, and get, do whatever I have to do to get ready and go to bed without turning any lights on. Or maybe I get up and, and sometimes I get to church and, and wonder how I look because I can get up and uh and get dressed in the dark and i'm pretty good at getting around in the dark unless maybe um robin changes the furniture around i've been known to like kick a coffee table or fa place face plant in the living room you know or something but uh but other than that i get around pretty pretty well in the dark because we become accustomed to the dark but what i have found over the years and um and and you know even better here lately the last few years is that it doesn't take much light to shoo the darkness away. It might be a little night light, a little two-watt bulb in your hallway, um, or, or maybe a uh, candle. My favorite now, since I get up, if it's dark, is, is this little boy right here, okay? I don't have to turn the flashlight on. All you need is that screen right there. And that little bit of light, whatever it puts out, can show you where to step so that you don't get into trouble. It doesn't take much light to, to move darkness. Darkness never overpowers light. Have you thought about that? No matter how small the light is, it overpowers the darkness around it. 
and you are the light of the world. He says, um, he says here good deeds are attractive. And, and for some reason we read that. And that's what he say, it says right here. Uh, in, in the same way, shine your light among men so that they can see your good deeds, right? And, and so, but there's something in there that tells us, hold it just a second. I think the Bible says we're not supposed to be, uh, that good deeds are not a good thing, right? Doesn't it say that somewhere? No, it, it never says that. It says that you need to have faith and good deeds, okay? Not one without the other. You've got to have both of them. You need faith and you need good works. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to work your way into heaven, but what it means is, is you can't say Jesus is my Savior, but I'm not going to do anything for him. It says do good deeds. Oh, but give the praise to your Father in heaven. Yeah. Good deeds aren't supposed to have anything to do with us. We're not supposed to boast about doing good things. And so here's a challenge. Ask yourself this, how bright are you shining? Are you, are you a bright light? I just thought of a story. i got to share this with you. Do I have time? Yeah, i got time. So uh, about uh, that was a long time ago, 30 years, years or more, a friend and I went to uh, South Carolina, and uh, we were going to North Carolina. We took a little detour through South Carolina to uh, see his brother, and we didn't know where the guy lived. He gave us an address. This was before GPS. We had a map, but you know, back then you had to buy a city map or you just kind of guess, right? And so we're in Columbia, South Carolina, and, um, and we realized we were kind of getting close. We kind of knew where it was. We get over there close. We're in a very upscale neighborhood, all right? Here we are. Picture this. We're in a Ford four-wheel drive uh, truck with Arkansas tags, and, and we get into this neighborhood, and, and they don't have regular street signs or stop signs or yield signs. They're all cut out of wood, okay? And, and those things, you can't read them at all at night. Promise me. And so we're tooling around this neighborhood trying to find this street. We can't see it. He finally got frustrated, reaches behind the seat of his truck, and pulls out what we referred to as a Q-beam, okay? Right? It plugged into your cigarette lighter. This dude... When you turned it on, if you looked at it, you couldn't see anything for like three weeks, okay? And it was used for frog gigging, all right? And, and the frogs just wanted you to gig them to get them out of their misery because their, their skin was burning. He was, we were driving around, actually he was driving around, and I'm shining this light at, at the neighborhood sign. Would you be surprised that we got lit up with red and blue lights behind us, okay? I don't think one person called the cops. I think it was like a citywide call of 911. We had about six policemen behind us. And this guy walked up there, and I, I won't ever forget this. He said, what in the Hades are you boys from Arkansas doing? <laughs> And then he took us to where we were going. He was a nice guy, but you know what? He didn't appreciate the fact that we lit up their city. Sometimes folks don't appreciate it when you light up their world. But there's a world of people out there who want to find Jesus, and they want to find the light, and you're the source of that light. Jesus is the source. Or you're the one that reflects it. Our challenge is this. How bright are you shining? Who are you shining for? Finally, this. Jesus came to make the, the, this whole thing better. All right? Jesus came to improve everything around him. He says that. And he offended everybody with a little bit of what he said. But he says here in verse um, uh, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. All right? Jesus, uh, he took the words of, of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the Holy Scripture. He took the, the law of Moses and he said, you know what, I'm not throwing it away, but I'm going to make it better. I'm going to fulfill it. You people are going to, if you'll live with the words I say, and we're going to tweak it. And so as we go through the next few weeks, we're going to hear him say, you have heard it's been said, and that's basically the Old Testament law. And he's going to say, but here's, what, here's how we're going to make it better. What Jesus did here, though, was he picked a fight. All right? 
He did. He, um, he, he was accused of not taking the law seriously. Um, that's not true. He had high, high regard for the law. When the devil tempted Jesus three times, right after Jesus uh, was baptized and went into the wilderness, the devil appeared and tempted him three times. How did Jesus answer him? He answered him with, with Scripture. He knew the Scripture. He knew the law. He had been handed down, and he revered it as good and as holy. But he said, I got, I, I'm going to uh, clean this thing up for you just a bit. The, the law was given not just to, to bless people, but it was, made, it was given to make people aware of where they were falling short of God's glory. It was rules to live by when there were no rules, but when they got these rules, they realized, hold it just a second, we're not very good at this deal. You can never satisfy the law. You're never going to be perfect. You can't obey it completely. And if you use it for a checklist like the Pharisees did, all you're going to do is end up short. And that's why Jesus said in verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so when he says this, the religious people were offended. They said, hold it just a second. You're talking about us, brother. We are the religious people. We're the Pharisee. Hold it. We're Pharisee here. Right here, Pharisee. And he said, you know what? If you don't do better than those folks, then you're not going to get to heaven. And they were offended. But then there's all those other people out there, all the common folks, the ones who were just kind of had never really understood the law. They could not, they didn't, nobody put it in, in human words for them. They didn't know it. And they said, hold it just a second. If the Pharisees aren't good enough, how are we ever going to get in? Well, Jesus says there's a third choice. You don't need a, a teacher of the law. You don't need to go on sinning. What you need is a Savior. And that's what we need today. We don't need more laws. We don't need to just throw up our hands and quit. We just need to humble ourselves enough to know that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And that he is the way to the Father. Now the rest of this sermon is basically Jesus taking what the law said and, and just making it better. And there's going to there's gonna be some times over the next few weeks that we step on some toes. There are going to be some times where you may say, you know, I kind of believe that, that that's true, but I'm not sure. We want you to study it. I want you to dig deep and see what you think it says. But we're going to give you a challenge. And your challenge today is this. It's our, our, we use this for our takeaway. Here's our takeaway today. Ask yourself this, are you salty? Are you the salt of the earth? Number one, are you salty? Number two, are you a light? Are you illuminating the world around you? Are, are you are, do people like to see you walk into a room? Hmm? Do you, do, does, it, does it bring a smile on folks when you uh, come into their presence? You see, we're living in a dark world, and, and if, you're, if you're lighting the place up, there may be a few folks that, that don't like that, but overall, folks are going to be happy to see you. And the last thing is this, are you in the Word? Do you know the Word, but you're not so rigid that you lose your saltiness and light? Jesus said, you've got to be better than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They know the law up and down and backwards and forwards, and, and they're good at the law, but you know what? They're not good at you. They can't relate to you. Go be salt. Go be light. Know the word. Live the word. And live for Jesus. We're going to ask you this morning. You stand. And we're going we're gonna to close. And I'm just going to tell you, I want to say again um, that I appreciate Brandon. I appreciate you as a church family. I love you guys. You're the church. Be the church. But what I want you to know is this. Sometimes um, our world gets a little little rocky, and uh, we struggle, all of us, me included. And so if you're at a place where you're struggling, if you're at a place where, where you feel like uh, you're not salt, you're not light, and you're not sure where you are right now, I'm going to stand right over there.
We're going to turn off our live feed in just a second. We'll be off camera anyway. And I want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. I want you to leave here today 